Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session about um, highly available Cloud Foundry on Cube. Uh, I'm Vlad Ivanov. I work as a technical lead for Cloud Foundry at SUSE. And I'm going to talk to you today about SUSE Cloud Application Platform, uh, how we've containerized it, and how we're trying to make it highly available. So what is it? It's, it's a platform as a service that's based on Cloud Foundry, uh, runs applications, has a large number of components just like uh, Cloud Foundry does, and it's deployed on Cube using Helm. So probably everyone here knows uh, a few of these components. Um, it's Cap is made of the exact same stuff as Cloud Foundry is. It's actually built from the same sources. So we have here the exact same pieces as Cloud Foundry, and this is a view that shows them kind of grouped by, uh, by their function. And every container uh, in the system is actually represented by a green box. So again, same Cloud Foundry that you know and love, just containerized. And we can see that there are quite a few components. So containerizing them is only part of the story. Uh, that can happen automatically. And once you do that, it, it becomes easy. But actually running it and orchestrating it uh, can be difficult. And making that happen in a highly available fashion can be even more difficult. So next. We hope you realize that um, some boxes have turned red. So it's useful to think about the critical pieces of the system, uh, that you want to be highly available more than anything else. So in this case, uh, you can see that the elastic runtime is red and routing is red as well. So basically, these are the things that run your applications and also route traffic to them. And this is very important. You, you want the system to gracefully degrade, but the application and, of course, traffic flowing through them should still be online. So this is the most important part of, uh, of Cloud Foundry, let's say. You want the applications to stay online. It's OK if you can't deploy applications for uh, a few minutes or for an hour while, while you deal with the, with the problem that, um, that occurred but you want applications to stay online. And being aware of these critical pieces is important because it, it drives us to make uh, specific decisions on how we locate components. For example, we have special affinity and anti-affinity rules for the router and for the Diego cells that make, make them um, run better uh, separately. OK. So how are we containerizing Cloud Foundry? Uh, we all know that Cloud Foundry is usually deployed using Bosch. And um, Bosch is a tool chain that allows deployment of highly complicated systems on top of VMs. But we wanted to do containers on top of Kubernetes, so we, we had to develop this tool called Fissile to essentially convert Bosch releases into Docker images. And we're still using Bosch. So Bosch takes you from your source code uh, to your nth day deployment uh, in your environment. But a lot of Bosch is how you package your sources. So packages, jobs, stem cells, and so on. So we use all that release information, um, the spec for the packages, for the jobs, how you compile things. We use all that information to create the container images. And we actually build the stem cell just like you build a normal Bosch stem cell. So at, at some point during the Bosch stem cell cre VM creation process, um, uh, there's a split happening. On the one side, you, uh, you actually convert the OS image into a Bosch stem cell that's specific to the CPI that you're going to use, or Azure, AWS, and so on. And for us, on the other hand, we turn that OS image into a Docker image. And that's the basis for all of the containers that make up uh, our cloud application platform. 
So essentially the same, we just skip the CPI parts that, um, that kind of turn each bar stem cell into a, uh, a YAS specific uh, DM image. <coughs> and since we actually use the same exact sources, so we use the, um, the CAPI release, Diego release, and so on, uh, we actually believe that we can uh, be a certified uh, distro by the foundation. Okay, so going back a bit to high availability, uh, we want to think about the mechanisms that we need to make each component of Cloud Foundry highly available. And um, we kind of have two flavors that, uh, that we work with. Things that can be load balanced, things like the cloud controller or the routers or the Diego cells. And then you have things that cluster. So for example, my MariaDB or etcd or console. Uh, these are a bit more special. The actual replicas that you instantiate uh, need to be aware of each other. Um, so for example, replica number one of MySQL needs to have a specific address that you can reach it, where you can reach it, and if it goes down and comes back up, it needs to come back up as MySQL 1. So other replicas in the network need to be able to identify it, and it needs to be able to identify itself. Um, for the load balance pieces, you, you know, you can just uh, add more routers, put a load balancer in front of them, and it's, it's all okay. You don't need to specifically be able to identify a router, and you can also start them up all at the same time. So. Um, it's a bit easier to, to run these load balanced uh, components um, rather than the, the clustered one. And next to these uh, two flavors, we also have components that follow a, a, an active passive model. So for example, I think the Diego database does this. Uh, you can run multiple uh, replicas of it, but only one will be active at the, at the, at the same time. So they will connect to console, they'll grab a lock from there, one of them will be elected as the master and the other, other ones will be passive, um, meaning that whenever the master goes down, uh, one of the passives will, will be promoted and they'll become the active component. So we need to be able to support all these uh, flavors, all of these configurations, and this is where um, Kubernetes comes in. And we have various cube primitives that allow us to, um, to configure uh, a deployment, uh, a, a deployment of, of, of Cloud Foundry. So um, we have uh, the FISAL tool that I, that I talked about earlier that actually turns Bosch releases into uh, container images. It also creates cube configs and Helm charts. And Helm charts are basically templatized uh, cube configs that describe uh, everything you need in order to, to stand Cloud Foundry up. So we have services, storage classes, deployments, uh, stateful sets, uh, probes of various kinds, pods. And uh, I'm going to talk about a few of these in detail so you can understand how, how we use them and what, what they offer. So first, we have cube services. And cube services describe how we want to talk to a component. Um, so for each of those components that you saw at the beginning, uh, we have services that describe how you talk to them. And that includes the port, the protocol that you use to talk to them. And um, after you describe a service and you, you kind of turn it on for, for a pod, uh, you also get uh, an address for that service. So for example, you get console.cf.svc.cluster. So that's a, a well-known address for that service, in our case console, and for that port, 8500. And this will actually also load balance. So you create a service for the console component. What you get is an address. Uh, you get load balancing for it. 
So we define multiple of these for each component and for each port and protocol that we need in the system. So if you were to look at our Helm charts, you'll, you'll see a bunch of these services pop up. And you can imagine that the load balancing is very useful uh, for our HA um, requirements. So next, stateful sets. These are very important because they allow us to support clustered components like MariaDB. Um, in a cube deployment, uh, pod replicas have no real uh, distinction. You can't tell one from the other. They get a random uh, host name when they start up, and uh, that's basically it. And you have no control over uh, when they start. So if I want, say, 20 routers, they'll all start up. They'll be de deployed across uh, Kubernetes nodes, and they'll eventually come up uh, in whatever order. Uh, in, with a stateful set, uh, you actually get an index. So all of those troopers there are different. They're the same, but they're different. Uh, you can identify them by an index, and um, Cube will also make sure that each index is it's started in a particular order. So say you have, again, three, um, three NATS uh, replicas. NATS number one will not come up until NATS number zero is up and ready. And we're gonna, gonna talk about uh, what it means to be alive and ready uh, in a second. But that's very important. So um, they don't all start up at once. Uh, Kubernetes will make sure that they start in an ordered fashion so that you, know, you can do database migrations in index zero, and then when index one comes up, it can talk to index zero. It knows that it's there. It can share information with it. It, it can talk to it. So it enables us to deploy um, clusterable things like, uh, like MariaDB. Uh, furthermore, uh, with, with deployments, when, when you create a service for, for, for pods, you get that load balancing that's basically round robin across all the pods that you, that you deployed. And you can't really target an individual pod by a well-known address. But stateful sets uh, give you this capability. So here, if I have a stateful set for NATS, I actually have NATS-1, so the index of the, um, of the replica, uh, and I can be sure that it'll always target uh, NATS number one. So individual components of, the, uh, of, of that clusterable component can talk to each other by a well-known address. Now we have probes. So there are two types of probes that we use. Um, there's a liveness probe that basically detects when a container is running or not running. And based on this, uh, we restart. So for example, if, if something bad has happened in the container, uh, the liveness probe should be able to detect that and then Cube will actually take action and restart the pod. And since we automatically generate these configurations, um, we, we use the, I think in almost all cases, we use Monit to figure out if something is wrong inside the container. So Monit has an API. Like I said, we, so if you look inside a container, it's basically the same as a, as a Bosch VM. So you'll find Monit there, you know, you'll, you'll find var vcap uh, directories and so on. And we use Monit to tell if, if the container is, is, uh, is okay and alive or not. And then you have the readiness probes. And these are very cool. Basically, um, the readiness probe will tell Cube if that container is ready to accept traffic. So this is exactly what we want for um, the active-passive model. So if, if one of the containers grabs the lock from console and becomes the master, it'll actually tell Kubernetes via the readiness probes that it's ready to accept traffic. Uh, all the other ones won't be able to do that and they won't show up as ready. And that's okay, I mean, if you do, you know, kubectl uh, get pods for your namespace, you will see a bunch of pods that are not ready, but that's okay. That doesn't mean they're not healthy, they're just not ready to accept traffic. And if you kill the one that it actually is ready, 
uh, you'll see that uh, one of the other ones will grab the lock, become ready, and then Kube will start routing traffic to, to it. And of course, this is also important for uh, clusterable services, uh, clusterable components. You don't want them to accept traffic while, they're st while data is still being migrated. So uh, very useful uh, capability there. OK, so now that we kind of know the primitives that we used in Cube uh, to be able to, to achieve high availability, uh, I want to talk a bit about how we're exposing it uh, with Helm. So Helm is where everything kind of comes together. Uh, in the end, even though this is capable, we can do this, even though this is possible, we also want to make it easy for, for, the, for the operator. So when someone is managing their CF deployment, it should be easy for them to scale their cluster up and down, uh, move from a basic deployment to an HA1, and so on. So I'm not sure if you can read this, but um, you can see there the, um, the count for NATs, for example. Uh, for the operator, it's as easy as changing that value from one to three. And what will happen in the background is that the Helm templates will pick up that change in value and will actually change the replica count of the NATs stateful set. It'll change a bunch of environment variables. And the operator is not aware of all this complexity. They just change from one to three, and then a bunch of stuff happens in the background. Uh, pods get restarted. Uh, components that need to be aware that NATS has gone from non-HA to HA will be restarted. And essentially, the cluster will transition from a, from a basic deployment to, to an HA1 uh, seamlessly. And this is all possible uh, using these uh, Helm templates. So, so what have we achieved so far? We can horizontally scale the critical pieces to make sure that user apps uh, stay online and they suffer no downtime. Uh, we can actually make all of the cap components HA. So when, when you do an upgrade and you do rolling upgrades, uh, the, all the components uh, stay up and running. And um, the service doesn't, doesn't degrade, essentially. We, we talked about the fact that you know, it, it would be OK kind of if it degraded and your application still stayed online. But we actually want to make sure that when you do an upgrade, um, there's no degradation in, in um, uh, there's no degradation in the service. And then um, we want to survive the chaos monkey. Uh, little disclaimer here is not the actual Netflix chaos monkey. Uh, we just uh, wrote a simple script that uh, gets a random pod uh, from the deployment and uh, basically just kills it. So I'm going to show um, a video here, because this has actually happened. Um, this was recorded across uh, three hours. Um, this is a full deployment. Oh, you can't actually see this. There we go. So this is a, a full deployment of, uh, of the cloud application platform, runs on Kubernetes. Uh, it has an application deployed on it with uh, four instances. And we have this uh, Chaos Monkey script that kills something every three minutes. And um, we will see that we have uh, uh, some scripts that constantly monitor the API of Cloud Foundry and the application that's deployed there and counts how many times it uh, succeeded and how many times it failed. And this was done over three hours, and it compressed it to uh, a few minutes. So uh, hopefully you can read this. Um, so on the left here, you see the actual list of all the pods running in the system. Uh, you can see a few of the components that are active passive. So you have the Diego database there. Uh, one of them is the master, one of them is, is passive there, so it's not ready. And as we move, move forward, uh, we're going to start seeing things uh, being killed on the right here. 
And on the right, you see application requests that have happened, uh, how many of them were okay and how many of them failed. Uh, same for, for the API. And um, I'm gonna fast forward through this a bit. So the movie does accelerate, you'll see here. And essentially you'll see things popping in and out of existence as things get killed. So what we want to happen here is that we don't want to see application requests failing or API requests failing. And um, we just run this for, for about three hours. And you'll see that uh, we kill essentially everything. Uh, there are no special pieces here. Uh, we, we kill MySQL, we kill NATs, we kill the cells, uh, the API, all of these things. And uh, if you look at the pod list, you can actually see which ones are deployed as stateful sets. So they actually have an index, 0, 1, 2, versus the ones that are deployed as a, as a cube deployment that just have uh, random strings in, in their name. So in total over these three hours, um, we had 54 killings of various components in the system. Um, there was a 99.5% uh, application availability and 99.8% for, for the API. This is actually the other way around. We actually want more app availability than API availability. Like I said, we don't really care if you lose um, the ability to deploy a new application across a few minutes, but you care if the application is down. So uh, we still have some work to do, but um, I think we'll get there because Sit there. So, um, in conclusion, I'd like to say that uh, Cube is an awesome fo host for Cloud Foundry. Uh, it can make it uh, run in a highly available fashion. It can do this seamlessly. It has all the primitives required to uh, to do this. Um, and um, we've actually deployed um, the same exact bit. So. Um, our product is uh, open source. You can see it at uh, github.com slash suze slash scf. We have a better release there that you can deploy uh, by yourself. And the, the reason we think is it's an awesome host is that we deployed the beta bits on Google Container Engine and on Azure Container Services uh, with very few changes, just enabling some, some kernel parameters on the VMs that run there. So the exact same Helm release uh, that we deployed um, on top of our own container management stuff on, uh, uh, ran fine on Google Container Engine and Azure Container Services. So Cloud Foundry loves Cube, I think. So um, I'm gonna open it up for questions. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, how, did you test uh, the infrastructure level failures and loss, loss of a host? So the question is if we tested uh, loss of an entire host. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Uh, we're getting to it. This was a, a small deployment. It was not across uh, multiple AZs or anything like that. It was actually just sitting on one VMs. We just wanted to test the actual concept that all of the cube pieces work as expected so that the services are, are correctly routing, that stateful sets come back uh, online without any loss of data and so on. Yeah. How does the deployment compare to a Bosch deployment? Speed of the deployment. So once the, uh, depending on how uh, fast your hardware is, uh, after the images get downloaded from the registry, and you can think about this like um, 
like a Bosch compiled release because the container images have all the compiled binaries inside them. Um, about five minutes, you'll get stuff running. So if you were to deploy on, on Azure, on medium VMs for the cube nodes, um, everything will stand up in about five minutes. So the question is about a parallel between how Kubernetes will act as a host versus uh, compared to OpenStack and Bosch being a host for Cloud Foundry deployments, and how you know the host can um, the host system that you deploy on has various uh, configuration settings like timeouts that can affect the health uh, of the system. So um, Kube gives you a lot of control on how these types of things uh, are set up for the deployment that you're doing. So timeouts for readiness probes, for liveness probes, and so on. Um, we haven't seen an issue moving from Azure to Google to our own Kube deployment so far. Um, we do have some specific requirements for the Kube uh, that's, uh, that's supposed to host us. Things like uh, enabling privilege mode, uh, of course having a um, uh, an, like an overlay network available, um, having um, some specific ker kernel parameters enabled. But overall, I think um, uh, it should be easier because Kubernetes exposes uh, timeouts and you know the network topology to us so that we can make the decisions instead of the actual infrastructure. So it should be okay, we think, or at least better. Yep. Did you have the, the chance to go over Kubernetes updates while this uh, application running on top of it? So the question is if we were able to do an upgrade, uh, like a Helm upgrade while the system was running. So we're working on that right now. Um, the one reason we can't do it with the beta release that's available there is how we treat secrets. Basically, every time that we uh, do an upgrade, all the secrets get rotated. So, of course, most things will come up, but then they don't <laughs> because all the secrets got rotated. So. Uh, the question is, uh, if, the, if you create a secret inside Cube, is it available in Cloud Foundry? Uh, no, it's not. So you don't, from your application, you don't see the environment of the hosting, uh, of the hosting container. Um, just like in a VM, if you have a, an environment variable in a VM, the, the app is shielded from, from all of that. Why Kubernetes? So uh, why did we choose Kubernetes? So first, I, I think you mentioned the uh, CPI. Uh, we don't actually use a CPI for this. So this is de de not deployed using Bosch. It's deployed using Helm. There is a CPI, I think, available for Kube from SAP. Um, but th I think that's still in, in, early f in an early phase. Uh, why did we choose Kube? It's because it has all the features that we require. And I think the, the Kube community has a tremendous uh, momentum behind it. And uh, it, it seems to work great. So we looked at, uh, at all its capabilities and specifically around these stateful sets and, uh, and, and probes, we realized that we could deploy, um, uh, we can deploy on par with what you can do with Bosch and VMs. Yeah. Go ahead. 
Uh, can you please repeat? Uh, what is running inside of the Diego cells? So, yep. so the question is what's running inside of the uh, Diego cells? Uh, the same exact thing. So like I said, we built from the exact same sources. The Diego cell is one of those components that has to be privileged in order to be able to run containers in containers. <laughs> Uh, we realize that that sometimes sounds scary, that you're running containers in containers, and it kind of sounds like VMs in VMs. But that's not actually the case because you're sharing the kernel. You're not running a kernel inside another kernel. So it's just uh, C group namespaces at the end of the day. So we haven't seen a, um, a performance uh, degradation or, or anything like that. So it's, it's Garden with a run C backend. And we actually use Groot FS. Uh, if you know, that's a, that's a new project uh, in, in Upstream Cloud Foundry that allows you to use um, a ButterFS or Overlay instead of uh, the old AUFS, uh, which helps us uh, greatly when conta containerizing Cloud, Cloud Foundry. Yeah. Uh, we haven't done those tests yet. Uh, you're looking at... Um, Application performance or infrastructure performance. infrastructure performance. Okay, yeah, we'll take a note and 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 look at that. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do we keep our Helm uh, chart essentially on par with the uh, with the Bosch manifest? So uh, Fissile will take up uh, Bosch releases. Uh, it uses the same exact descriptors as, uh, as, as the packages and jobs uh, specify. So those spec files. Consumes all of those, compiles everything. And then we, we wanted to expose configuration to the user in an opinionated way. So we, we don't expose everything that's available from uh, the Bosch releases. We only expose things via environment variables. So technically, if you wanted to, you could grab all of the Docker images, run them manually with specific environment variables, and you'd, you'd get a Cloud Foundry out of it. So the Helm templates only expose the environment variables that we choose as a distro of Cloud Foundry, and uh, the other ones are basically automatically generated. So you'll see, let me see if I can go back. You actually see something like this. This uh, doesn't contain the actual environment variables that I was discussing. But imagine you have a, a env dot domain there. Uh, and domain would be the domain of the, of, the, of the system. Or cloud admin password. And then we use those environment variables and feed them into the actual Bosch properties. And we feel that this makes it uh, much easier. Uh, you don't have to uh, repeat yourself as much, and you have one, uh, one way to configure the entire system, one uh, values file, essentially in Helm. So we don't expose it one to one. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Thank you.